It's been a year, well, more than a year. When did I make my typewriter video? Was that July of last year, I think? But uh, I got it out again because I was wondering, and maybe you were wondering too, being made out of 3D printed stuff and uh, super glue, does it still work? And I was very happy and kind of surprised to see that yes, it does still work. Um, although the reason I got it out has nothing to do with the video I made. I'm actually going to use this for an event and I had to do a little bit of cleanup. It, uh, it pretty much worked straight away, but I wanted to make a few improvements to it. And uh, along the way, a few things broke. So I thought I'd just go over some of those things today. And the main thing I wanted to add was a way for it to turn off so it can just be, you know, sitting on a table somewhere off and then uh, maybe the bell will ring or something and then it'll come on. And then well, it'll print out something for you to read. So the first thing I did was make a proper power supply. Um, you'll remember I had that old ATX supply as the 12 volt supply for the whole thing. All the solenoids and whatnot run off of 12 volts. Um, but uh, all I did for that was uh, find a 12 volt power supply. Uh, not like this one, it's a little bit bigger. Um, I think the one in here is supposed to be 12 volt, 13 amp or something, but it's a scrap power supply from something. And uh, I just made a, a little case for it. And you'll have to ignore all the burn marks around here. Uh, my printer isn't tuned quite as well as I want it to be, and uh, cracked a couple things and uh, tried to stick it back together there because I didn't feel like reprinting it. Uh, an IC connector there and uh, a outlet for the typewriter itself and then on the other side a little fan and a uh, good old T-pin good for high current uh, low voltage stuff. And as for the relay itself it's uh, just one of those little a uh, little 3 amp or 5 amp cube relays, 12 volts, uh, wired normally closed. And the reason I did that is, uh, you know, 12 volt relay run just like all the solenoids on the thing, but I wanted it to be able to run without the 12 volt connected, so now it's running. And onto the electronics. Not much here is much different than you saw last time. Uh, one of the first things I did was move the 5 volt linear regulator onto a proper heat sink um, before it was I think right around here but it gets pretty warm it goes you know 12 volt to 5 volt at uh, you know, some current enough to get eh, pretty pretty toasty um, and then it was well the whole thing is just a big aluminum casting why didn't I mount it there in the first place so now it's on there and it doesn't get hot anymore and from our power relay, we just have 12 volts. It's wired up just like the solenoids, except uh, I had to dig out an NPN transistor. For some reason, these were a little bit too leaky, and if I shut it off, enough would leak through the relay to keep it turned on. So I found a random NPN transistor in a box of, I guess, really old transistors. But you might remember that I was out of IOs on my main microcontroller here, so I didn't have any spare to control the power relay. Um, but luckily, I'm not out of IOs on the RS-232 side of things yet. I still had the DTR pin, which is sort of actually what it was used for. Um, the DTR pin goes high when the computer says that it has data to send. I mean, that's the original use for it. Uh, you know, these days, you can program a serial port however you want, and it's more or less just an IO pin. Um, but in my case, um, I want the active thing to be when the DTR pin is low, so when it's low, the relay is on, which means the typewriter is off. And uh, I just run run the current uh, through two opto-isolators because uh, what's easier than turning on an LED? And the other reason for that is uh, if I disconnect the serial port, now there is no current flowing through either of those, so the typewriter comes on, so again, it's usable as a normal typewriter without having the serial port plugged in. And I'm actually doing double duty with the second opto-isolator here on the same DTR pin. Because it turns out when it goes low, you can use that to reset the microcontroller. And if you're at all familiar with uh, the original AVRs, 
and uh, how the Arduino bootloader works. Um, you set the reset pin low, and that resets the chip, but the way that works is it's normally hooked up to the DTR pin, uh, this would be logic level here, through a capacitor, so when this goes low, briefly drops the reset line low, and then you can get into the serial bootloader. And that's really handy now that it's finished, because uh, what I was doing before was using an ISP program I would like this, so whenever I wanted to make changes to the firmware, I'd have to open the case and then connect this to this header here. But uh, now that it's finished, it's much easier to leave the whole typewriter closed. And uh, anytime I want to work on firmware, I can just use the serial port normally and uh, go through the Arduino bootloader. On the mechanical side of things, everything's held up really surprisingly well. Um, all the uh, plastic pieces are ABS, so... You know, under the tension of a screw, this isn't going to flow out like PLA. And uh, PETG is not particularly good with glue, but uh, ABS works. And uh, yeah, everything on here is still on nice and secure. There's only a few things that I broke, but that's from my own clumsiness. And uh, as far as any adjustments, there was uh, really only one thing I noticed when I took this out of storage which is this latch right here. This is a very finicky latch in these typewriters. So when I push down a key, that latch will come unlatched and that's how it knows you know, that you pushed a key. Now what you can do is when it resets, the latch goes onto this little tab right here. So you can move this in and out, you know, this way with these two screws, and you can also move it forward and backward this way with these two screws. In messing with it uh, over the time I have messed with it, it's always these that are the problem. So you can see right there, it's just on the very edge of this. If you set that latch too far down, when you push a key, nothing will happen because it won't have enough travel to unlatch it. And if it's too far up, it will never relatch. So. It'll just be like you're holding down a key, kind of like uh, that. I was a little curious about these things, because this is, you know, metal on a plastic peg, if there'd be any wear on that. I mean, I haven't gone through really a whole ink ribbon yet, but uh, if you look really closely, there is a sort of a polished area, you know, around these pegs, and I think right here, yeah. That's a little bit of plastic that's worn off. When I was messing with it, I actually broke this one. And it broke right, uh, right back here, right where this peg goes from straight to where it angles over. Um, so I had to pull off this whole thing and then reprint this one piece, which was a whole difficult thing to find the right file for that. But uh, I did find it, reprinted it, stuck it back on there. Um, when I pulled it off, I did notice that the CA glue on that uh, holding, you know, this printed piece to this lever here, not exactly the strongest joint, but, uh, you know, at least for these other ones, certainly strong enough. And immediately after messing with this latch, that really throws the whole cycle bail timing off, which is this solenoid here. So remember in my original video, I was talking about having the solenoids pulled in, you know, as far as they can go, because that uh, gives them more strength, and, they, you know, if they're already in, there's less time they can react faster. Um, that was the case with this. So what I did was just stack a couple more O-rings behind that nut to pull this in a little bit, and that was enough to shore up the timing on that. Really the only thing that didn't hold up as far as the glue goes is the glue itself. Um, I like to use this, uh, I think this is like the cheapest glue that's like this on Amazon, but it's a, a bottle and then the activator. So it's activated CA glue, which makes CA glue work a lot like you think that it should instead of, you know, normal CA glue like... Uh, like that stuff that just sticks your fingers together and never dries on anything you want it to. And when I said glue itself, I didn't mean the glue on here, I meant the remaining glue, because this is 
got pretty much a solid block now. On the top, pretty much everything looks the way it did before. Um, there were a couple things that broke on here just from it being, you know, big and heavy and lots of exposed things that can break. So when you set it upside down, these usually hang down like this and you end up setting it on there. Um, so the end of this one bent over like that and these are cast. So when I tried to bend it back, it broke off. Um, but that's easily repairable with a little bit of JB weld and a, uh, a metal plate under there. So now it's good as new. And the other thing that broke was uh, on here. You'll notice how thin this is. I'm surprised it didn't break off earlier, but uh, this one did break off and I made, I could have printed the whole thing, but uh, instead what I did is cut this off and then take a picture to get the cross section which looks like this and then check the fit to make sure that this slips over there and uh, then copy this thing and make a mirror image of it and now that is a perfectly serviceable lever and I did keep the original metal cover thing that this one has just in case I do find another one of these plastic levers uh, the detail inside of here was a uh, a little bit too fine to print on an FDM printer. The final adjustment I made was to the ribbon lift. So as it's typing, this whole thing lifts up at different levels to, uh, you know, expose the whole ribbon area to the ball. And uh, right now you'll notice it's pretty much printing, you know, it's definitely in the middle of the ribbon. That was not the case when I got it. It was actually printing, uh, the ribbon was too low, so it was printing almost off this top edge here. I've pulled out some of the ribbon here and you can see it was printing very close to the top of the ribbon. If we look at some of the newer stuff, it's much more centered. And the adjustment for the ribbon lift is under this wheel. And uh, oh, what I now realize you're supposed to do is line up this hole with that, but you can also undo this clip and take this thing off. It comes off like this. And uh, if we get it into position, then uh, this little adjustment, oops, right here is like a little grub screw type plunger thing. If I lift this up, you'll notice how it lifts the whole ribbon. So you undo that nut and then tighten the set screw and it'll lift it up higher. Now, I didn't know where that adjustment was when I first looked at this, so I ended up taking this whole ribbon carrier out. You undo this screw and that screw, and this whole section that holds the reels comes off, along with this spring, that spring, and uh, you can't see it under here. Uh, under this wheel is where the ratchet is that controls the three levels of ribbon, um, but there's a little... Uh, lever pawl arm that you have to get back onto a wheel in there and that was okay but once I took these springs off I could not for the life of me figure out where they were supposed to go back uh, this lower one is pretty easy this one was really confusing so there's a little hole in this thing here which is also part of the ribbon lifting thing but I thought I'd get a good shot of that because I couldn't find one and I was too stupid to take pictures of it beforehand. And one of the last things is this little pointer right here, which the original was plastic. And uh, when you take the top cover off, what's supposed to happen, like with these, is that it flips up. Of course, I always forget to do that and immediately broke it, but a little piece of wire Seems to work just as well. As far as the firmware goes, there's not a lot of new functionality I added to it, but one of the things I did do was have an auto new line function. Because conceptually, there's no ability for the typewriter to tell where the 
carriage actually is, but I do keep track of the carriage position because when I do a carriage return from software, if the carriage is over here, it takes longer to return than it does if it was, say, there. You know, if I did all the carriage returns long, you know, you hit this and it'd be waiting and then it would go. So because I keep track of the carriage position in software, it's actually really easy to do an auto new line. All I have to do is position the carriage to where I want the new line, where the edge of the page is rather, and then push a key combination. And now, whenever something gets sent to it, it will only go to that line, not further. And I can clear it as well. But now I don't have to worry about the carriage going off the edge of the page anymore, which is useful. Now another useful thing about the DTR pin is even if you don't control it directly like this from software, usually when you open and close the serial port, um, when you open it, the DTR pin goes high, and when you close the port, it's off. So you don't even have to do anything uh, more special than uh, open and close the serial port if you want it to be on or off and it's ready to go again. Now, I think I got the most comments on my last video from people who wanted me to run like NeoFetch or Vim or HTOP or any of those full screen, you know, apps on here. And I'm gonna show you why you can't do that, but uh, first, uh, we're running Linux here in a virtual machine, so I'll give it the serial port. Where is that, there it is. And let's just make sure it's there. TTY USB zero, it's there. And then the command you want to run is this. Now you can set up systemd to automatically manage your serial ports and you know, all that fancy stuff. But for a one-off, you can just run a single command. Uh, this is alternative Getty. Dash H means you use hardware flow control. This is the serial port we want. That's the baud rate. And then at the end is the terminal type. So if you had a VT100, you put it in there. And this is where it really gets into the weeds of weird old configuration Linux stuff that's from even before Linux. I found that dumb, dumb works as a terminal type for this. I think I did in my previous video go through and do a proper term info and all that stuff that I don't remember a year later. So let's just go. Now the reason you can't do any kind of full screen applications on this is twofold. Number one is that there's no mechanism to make the paper go down. It can only ever go up. And uh, the second reason is that this has no understanding of control codes. So you have your ANSI control codes, your VT100 escape codes, both do the same thing. You can make the cursor jump around to any position on screen, you can change colors. I think you can change brightness, uh, you know, underline, stuff like that. Um, but that's just software. I definitely could have put it into the microcontroller on here. I'm sure it would fit. Um, but the other reason is that uh, even if you could make this go down, it uh, is not a correcting unit. So the later Selectrix had a button right here you could push, and then you hit a key, and it would bring up a correcting ribbon and suck the ink right off the page. If this was a correcting unit, I probably definitely would have gone down that path because it sounds hilarious. But uh, as it stands right now, I took the easier approach and it's just a, well, it's a typewriter hooked up to a computer. For the record, if you do try to run NeoFetch, this is what happens. So there you go, the one year update video that no one asked for, but you got anyway. It's still here, it still works. 
It's still not as good as a real teletype in some ways, but better than a real one in other ways. Good night.